I am your host, Lee Alexander. I'm a journalist. I'm hoping not to be steamrolled too much by these great design minds that I've been tasked with moderating. Um, before we introduce the topic of the panel, uh, I want to invite the panelists to introduce themselves. They've decided on a sort of running order for their points, so I'm going to start with that. Maddie Bryce. Hi, everyone. I'm Maddie Bryce, and I am paid to kill video games. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Maddie. We have Mohini Freya Dutta coming to us via space computer. <laughs> Hi, Mohini. Can you hear us? Uh oh. Hey, Mohini, are you with us? Hello from Mumbai. Hey, <laughs> Mohini, would you like so, to tell? So, as you know, my name is Mohini, and I'm a game designer who likes to talk about how games engage with culture. And also, it's 4 a.m. here, so sorry if there's some disconnect. <laughs> <laughs> what a soldier! Welcome, Mohini. <laughs> Next up, we have the inimitable Naomi Clark. Yeah. Woo! Hi, I'm uh, Naomi Clark, doing my best imitation of Naomi Clark. <laughs> and uh, I'm an independent game designer, um, writer, and teacher here in New York City. Welcome. And finally, we have Mr. Nick Fortuno. <laughs> That's good. I want hooting and clapping yeah, and engagement with, from you guys. You uh, I'm Nick Fortuno. I'm a game designer, teacher, and artist who's been working for about 15 years in New York. Welcome, panelists. So we are here for an impassioned discussion, a full-throated debate on a deceptively complex issue. Isn't Matty's hair cute? Oh, wait. I think someone must have messed with my notes. Um, the actual d issue that we will be debating today is can the mechanics of a game be separated from its content and message? And if so, should they? Now, panelists, I've decided to attempt to impose a surprise last minute rule without discussing <laughs> any of it with you first. Do you think that we can have this discussion without once invoking the F word? <laughs> If you have in your notes or on your lips or tongue anywhere the word formalism, sure. <laughs> I would like to encourage you to find a way to rephrase what you mean so that, we are so that we're talking about our attitudes and beliefs about design without resorting to a formalism or anti-formalism binary. Do we think that's something that we can do? I'll, 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 I'll press the slime button if anyone screws up. <laughs> So uh, starting with the opening question about can the mechanics of a game be separated from its content and message, each panelist is going to take about four minutes to give their own sort of opening remarks, and then I'm going to moderate the question and, and answer session among the panelists. Um, we've decided to start with Maddie. So would you like to begin? I will. Awesome. When it comes to both designing and critiquing play experiences, not only can we not separate mechanics from content, but they should not be made distinct and often oppositional from one another. Mechanics and content are actually indistinguishable aspects of a complex living experiences, and these concepts exist only as lenses with their own, and I think faulty, purposes of use. This isn't just a matter of taste or discipline, but a call to resist a, uh, the power behind this naming and separation that acts to erase the native contexts that live in play experiences and depoliticize them for consumption. There's a reason discourse cycles continuously back onto mechanics versus content arguments, mainly because any source of exceptionalism and legitimacy for games, as told by dominant narratives, um, rest on them in being in contrast. They are cast as separate but equal, but as history shows us, the need to create a sense of equality shows that there are unexamined yet very real power differentials at work. It is in these hidden power dynamics that games are given their current context that have been made into the status quo of creation and analysis. 
This proposed distinction rests on a false binary of interactive versus non-interactive, privileging only what is considered interactive in this context. Everything in, in every piece of media we experience is interactive. And the decision to raise up concepts like choice and agency with narrow considerations of what both are is political in of itself. With, when designated as such, mechanics become separated from contexts that give them meaning, now only propped up corpses with claims of being dynamic elements. The act of separating mechanics and content overwrites the living context of the experience and attempts to depoliticize what is considered to be the game part of play. This is, it is a violent act, cutting out the influence of what is dubbed content and devaluing it as topical and ineffectual. The language of purity and objectivity around what is dubbed mechanics privilege certain kinds of play experiences and interpretations. Legitimizing mechanics versus content as a dynamic harms play as a form by obscuring how politics manifest. Design and analyses that follow suit evade critique by attempting to make, it, uh, make what is political negligible. Ultimately, we need to look past this smokescreen to better understand how politics are accessed and make play experiences that are actually impactful outside of financial gain and technological progress. When we do treat play as a live whole with its own context and multifaceted ways of interacting outside of itself, we can, we can see what is usually considered content as active agents of play instead of static messaging from other forms of art. We can untangle discussions around emerging art and artists from the canonized progression narratives and expectations to conform to harmful institutions. For one, this will enable us to get past the usual bemoaning of how content is under the domain of other disciplines and create play-specific concepts for them instead. Or how our, bo our varying bodies receive information and meaning through the senses radically differently and personally from one another. Even further, normalizing how imperative it is to include one's and other's bodies and their unique experiences in designs and critiques. What is valued in design and analysis is in a constant reifying cycle with contemporary design conventions, past commercial successes, and the influences related to these. Breaking from this cycle allows further growth of alternate histories of creation and aesthetics, as well as stronger connections to histories outside of games and their conventions altogether. And with that, include meaningful context and experiences that don't center around agency and choice, but are in fact playful. Design rarely accounts for real life and designing within it, and understanding how people are affected throughout life and how we transfer back and forth politics is vitally important path for people who design play experiences to, begin, uh, to understand and work with. We need to, under, we need to deepen how we address political matter past its current topicality and appearance in dead blunt systems. I seek to expand what we value as influential and impactful during and within play. Adopting my view, view would move designers and critics closer to social work and change, not solving, but working upon and against the world. Uh, we all know sorely needs change. Thank you. Thank you, Maddie. So the way that we currently look at things privileges some ideas about interactivity over others and ignores uh, political context, if I can maybe paraphrase a little bit. Um, so next is Mohini. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> discussions around games often go down one of two routes. The sacred purity of the logic, like discussing game mechanics, or the profane use of aesthetics to provide problematic engagements within the medium of games. This creates a false paradox. You won't say who. I found this interesting. It is not coming from a history of nostalgic play. I've always seen games as being about topics, the nature of those topics changing with the prevalent debates of the time. What I get from all of this is that the aesthetic fabric of games is seen as lesser than the superior structure of its mechanics by most folks engaged in the making of games. But the aesthetics are often the most accessible aspects of games to players, the recipients of our ludic constructs. I've been living in Mumbai, India, for the last year and a half, and although it was a forced transition, it has had some advantages, one of which being that I have barely any game people around, and, and I mostly engage with non-gamers and non-game designers, so casual players. 
And casual players I've been speaking to often don't care about the feel of the game or the beauty of its logic, picking a game because it looked nice and spoke to them through the thumbnail on the App Store. However, you could say that from the layperson's point of view, discussions around games are very different when compared to that of makers and critics engaged in a more nuanced manner. So if games are considered to be systems of interaction that, while, that use play to create an engaged relationship with the player, and then and when crossed with the widely accepted mechanics, dynamics, and aesthetics framework, we get an understanding of, I won't shoot myself in the foot here by calling it a definition, not with this crowd, <laughs> of games as systems governed by their initial mechanics that are expressed using dynamic methods of interaction that are then supported in their quest to create a playful experience using the best suited aesthetic language in the act of engagement. What this says to me in, in a simpler language is that logic is the primary aspect of games supported by what you do in a game and made more palpable by how does the game appear to you. That, that, that part of it makes these logic structures accessible in their final interaction. Games once given to the player are defined by, ascribed meaning to, and made into cultural objects by the consumer, not the maker. This assessment is supported by how we use games, uh, how we use games, the iterative method of game making, Consist, considers playtest data or response of players to the intentional logic of the maker as paramount. This is how we make good games. So where then lies the unrealistic ideal of the platonically pure game mechanic? To say that the messy cultural context of games and their pure mechanics are separate entities is maker hubris. Just as writers cannot control the consumption of their writing, as irksome as, as it may seem, game makers cannot control the context in which their pristine temples of logic are consumed. However, just as authorship is celebrated and creates a hierarchy benefiting those with experience and accessibility to the medium, so does maker-defined discussions around games. So then, my argument today is about the irrelevance of the two-way split between games. The pure mechanic exists in the mind of the maker of the game, allowing the maker to decide the boundaries of the discussion based on their vision. The flawed aesthetics can always be tweaked or reskinned. The mechanics, though, are the soul of the games. If Context only exists in the aesthetics, then the mechanics can never be critiqued as cultural objects outside of the sheath of aesthetics. If mechanics are indeed the soul of a game and lie outside of culture, then are games really art? A critique of games through this dual lens gives games a convenient out when the discussion becomes uncomfortable, usually when games crash into inconveniently non-platonic spheres of culture. Secondly, this pure logic perception allows for certain groups who can access these elusive logic structures to create a false superiority over newer users of the medium, users who often enter the discussion through the lesser entry point of aesthetics. In my experience as a maker, player, uh, and critic of game culture, I've found that often mechanics have cultural contexts and aesthetics have logics to them. To understand games, we cannot look at them piecemeal, but we must look at them as a unified whole. Thank you. Thank you, Mohini. So despite the technical difficulties, we have the idea that this platonic ideal of the mechanical soul of a game uh, sort of removes it from the aesthetic and cultural context in which games are often consumed and accessed, if, if I'm paraphrasing somewhat correctly. She's a bit too smart for me. Uh, Naomi. <laughs> okay, so we live in a world where mechanics and content are already treated like two separate and real things, uh, things that are as real to us as money, race, or gender. Content and mechanics are actually already enshrined in and enforced by the law, which protects some aspects of a game automatically with copyright, and others only if you can muster a gang of patent attorneys. And the industry assigns some workers to devise and implement systems, while other specialists are tasked with producing content assets. So the question for me is whether we should be resisting this status quo. Is it a false and limiting portrayal of games? Well, of course it is. It's a dissection of the holistic experience of play, that spicy melange where mechanics and content actually blur into and are bound up in each other. We absolutely need more illumination of the totality of experience, especially in game criticism, and an illumination that doesn't privilege one over the other. At the same time, this dichotomy, should it be one or the other, is also a false binary, where we should absolutely be insisting on having it both ways, on taking games apart as well as treating them holistically. Analysis, the process of breaking something complex down into smaller parts, is a surgical tool. And like a scalpel, you can wield it destructively or violently. For instance, when a hater insists that a game like Gone Home can be evaluated by the fact that you can speed run it in 26 seconds, or that a narrative game becomes worthless if his choices don't lead to consequences that are pleasingly impactful for him. <laughs> 
This kind of reduction strips the meaning of a game to its structural skeleton, cutting away flesh and muscle. It's just as senseless as a scalpel-wielding cartoon murderer who wants to see what his victim's bone structure looks like under the skin. But surgery isn't all bad in the real world, right? We can also analyze in order to understand, diagnose, and birth different provocative creations. So many games, maybe most games, are created in part by cutting pieces, mechanics, and forms out of other games, putting them to use in new ways, to express other kinds of beauty and experience, or to turn towards values and politics that we seek to uphold in our work. And that's a bloody process. It can mean digging through decompiled code, playing a game until you've exhausted its meaning for you, or discovering that a simple rule has capacities that we've never dreamed of. So these things that we try to call mechanics, and we don't really totally understand what that word means, they really do have a, a difference in a way that's hard to encompass, precisely because it's less accessible, because it's hidden somewhere. And maybe because mechanics are not creations of human beings, they're things that are lurking in our minds, not logical, but also emotional, coiling around our brain stems. Deeply trying to understand what's going on with a game mechanic is a little like trying to inspect the back of your own eyeball. So we work with our hands, we grab what we think we know, uh, and we realize we don't have to abandon first-person targeting in a game just because it's mostly been used to shoot the enemies of America. We can actually think about what this mechanic itself does with our minds and whether we can seize it as a tool for our own ends, like uh, Bill Viola and Tracy Fullerton did in The Night Journey. We can see this kind of adaptation all over the place, like in the work of Paolo Perrucini, who relentlessly appropriates the systems of capitalism and efficiency in order to critique them. We can see beautiful traces of that process in games like Kentucky Route Zero, an edifice that shows the remnants of the mechanics it was built with, but which were then abandoned, becoming vestigial organs and bone spurs that create the fascinating curves of its surface. The divide between content and mechanics is definitely not the only way to analyze, deconstruct, reconstruct games, and it may not be anywhere close to the best way to appreciate them. It has its limits, and we take that too much for granted as an easy method. We should insist on treating a game holistically as well as surgically, not picking between the two, and luckily we don't have to choose. But I'm also thankful that we do have some method of being able to take games apart, pulling out their pieces and transplanting them to bring life to new games, to our own creative aims. So even as we continue to explore more ways of thinking about games, I suggest we should keep seizing those bloody chunks of bone and flesh to create new unimagined chimeras that'll take us to weird places. All right, here's to creating chimeras on resisting the status quo of dissection in order to illuminate the totality of experience while understanding that sometimes surgery is good for the health of the form. Next up is Nick. A definition of games that I think everyone agrees to is, has something to do with interaction. Um, <laughs> well. Because there always has to be a player. And whether that interaction is limited or far-reaching, or far -reaching, whether that interaction is prescribed or only in interpretation or broad-reaching in an open sandbox way, there is always a kind of interaction that takes place. And if there's a kind of interaction, that means there are things we have to have to make that interaction possible. We need state, we need input, we need feedback, we need combinatorics, we need probability, we need logic, we need math. Like These are things that make games up, they're systems. And no matter how we define games in the broad sense of what games are, if there is interaction, there's a system, because there's a user and a, and a thing that the user uses. Now, as logic, this does not contain content, because it's simply a logical mathematical tool. It would be like saying that the number two had content. Two is an abstraction that's designed for the purpose of serving content, and that's what it's used for. And you can use that logic to make as much content as you want, but that doesn't make it itself content. And the fact that we can ascribe political value to content as a culture does not then make the logic itself political. I can decide as a wealthy family in Marin that I don't believe in vaccination science. I can decide as a religious fanatic, I don't believe in the age of the earth. Did not, did, that did not change medicine and geology into culture. They remain science at some level. And at the level of abstraction, I think game mechanics live there too. Now these mechanics are critical because they speak to the most basic and abstract level as to what players do. At the bottom, the interactive system is defined by its interaction. So what a player does in the system is the key. And if we understand mechanics to be speaking to the logic of a system, then that's the atom of what every player does. Now we know this is true from evidence in the world. First, we know that people are naming games by genre, and we understand games conceptually by genre. So we'll talk about games as rhythm action games, or match three games, or hidden object games, or real-time strategy games. And despite the fact that there are a wide varieties of content in all of these fields, they're still understood generically to be defined by their play. We know this because people who are good at games of one mechanic show that skill in other games of the same mechanic. 
even if the content is wildly different. So players who are good at StarCraft are good at Pikmin. Players who are good at Halo are good at Portal and are good at Unfinished Swan. Players who are good at Day of the Tentacle are good at Walking Dead. Players who've played Pipe Dreams can hack in Bioshock completely. Players who've played Puzzle Quest in a really tight, consistent, and rewarding way can also destroy Candy Crush. And that consistency of mechanic is an indication of that there's a single thing that underlines all of these things. And we see in game cultures that people will play games entirely stripped of content when they become skilled enough to just see the content as something they're, the content is something they're not interested in, the mechanic as a pure thing. So master level chess players will play chess just by naming pieces that move without even using the word of the piece, just by naming the grid squares to which pieces move. We know that FPS players, when given sufficient time, will reduce the graphical quality of games to almost incomprehensible blurry shapes to reduce lag and to be able to move faster and act quicker in the game. If content was something that was meaningful to these players, that would not be possible. But since they can do it and still play the game, we know that this is true. And the reason why all of this matters is because of MDA, is because no one in the world fetishizes mechanics. No one in the world worships at a temple of logic. Everyone is concerned with aesthetics. But when people argue against the mechanical approach to the game, they deny the possibility that math can create art that there are aesthetics that come from the interactions of combinatorics and agency, that come from states and input and feedback by themselves, and that those aesthetics are things that we are interested in. The fact that they're not political doesn't mean that they're not aesthetic. They are used politically all the time. But we can dissect them and see them as logical structures so that we can reuse them in whatever context that we want. And the reason why this is critical is because when you talk about games without mechanics, it's like talking about painting without brushes and colors and perspective. These are the techniques that get us to the content we want to make. These are the techniques that give us empathy, compassion, power, and emotion. And if we don't use those techniques, we lose a major tool we have in making successful games. So technique and systems are the ways that we interact with our users to derive art and aesthetics. Now we go to the portion where every panelist, uh, starting with Maddie, is going to get to ask a question of another person of their choosing on the panel. Maddie, I know you've written before about the death of the player. Uh, however, you are free to ask whichever question you like of whichever panelist you like. <laughs> Hello? OK, awesome. So um, this is for Nick. Um, your last um, <laughs> 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 your last your last um, image was about like talking about games uh, without mechanics is like painting without brushes. So how do you account for the painters who use their hands and other kinds of things that you use implements? How about um, all of these sorts of other things that were considered like you know around the time of impressionism to not be art just because of exactly the form and things that they were using? Uh, a hand is a brush. It's a brush with five bristles, <laughs> right? And, and so when, when you think about the question of like what mechanics are, we don't want to reduce it down to a, a straw man that is just some like, like dream in the mind of Eric Zimmerman, right? What we want to do <laughs> is take, you know, take the full range of what mechanics can be and apply them in the broadest possible sense. So I'm talking about vehicles of interaction <laughs> in the broadest sense. That may be in Howling Dogs, a single button you click that denies a user an ability to move forward in any other way. But that's still a kind of interaction because you had to click the button. And so I think that when we think about it in that broad sense, what we're really doing is just breaking down the interactions to their atomic parts and looking at them that way. And in that sense, a variety of mechanics does not undermine the value of mechanics as a whole. Uh, I, I can't see. If anyone wants to chime in, they can raise their paddle. I can't see if Mohini has a paddle. Oh. Mohini, would you like to? <laughs> oh, <laughs> yay! <laughs> Mohini, would you like to join this topic? Yes, I would actually. Um, so Nick, I feel like what you're talking about is this sort of victimhood that math suffers from, not being part of artistic or aesthetic discussions. Mm. I think that's totally false, though. I mean, art is always considered math as a really big part of the way aesthetics are created, right? So I don't really understand why math needs to be pushed forward as the victim in this conversation. Could you speak a little bit more about that? <laughs> uh, I would actually argue that math isn't the victim of this conversation. <laughs> that math, and if, if math is the victim of this conversation in any way, it's because it's been excluded from the possibility of creating aesthetics in the favor of something else. I think math, it, math's purpose in all of this is to be an underlying structure that allows all of these other things to ride in a more effective way where players can engage with them. 
And so I'm not worried that mechanics are going to be denigrated. What I worry about is that when we stop talking about mechanics, we start talking about the basic operations of what we do, and that, imp that disempowers us to be able to do things well. I just don't want us to enter, enter into a Middle Ages where we forget what perspective is for a little while and then have to reclaim it at a later point. I want us to like, make sure that we're keeping track of that as we make whatever political statements we want to make. So speaking of <laughs> politics, oh, <laughs> you can have 30 seconds to rebut if you'd like. Uh, is that for me? Sorry? Yes, for you. Oh, excellent. Um, <laughs> great. So there's a, there's a historical precedent of uh, re removing logic from the context of its application as a way of um, removing sort of the problems of that underlying logic. I mean, the one that comes to mind is sort of uh, unrelated to games. But uh, in the building of empire, classical building of empire, say imperialism, um, um, as done, as pushed by Western European countries, um, often the cultural hegemony was pushed forward by um, prescribing um, a value to the aesthetics of Eastern ways of life, while Western forms of life are considered to be more rational, therefore more logical, therefore more sound. So there has been some precedent in logic being separated from its context as a way for being a superior way of uh, engaging with the topic. My issue isn't about not talking about math or logic. It's about talking about logic and aesthetics together. And why can't that happen? Why does it only need to be considered from one perspective? It's a very interesting question. And we are talking about some of the bigger issues here about what helps people access things? What, do the, what does it mean when they experience something in one way versus another? And there, I think well, most of the panelists agree that we want to take a holistic approach. There is a palpable tension uh, <laughs> between these two approaches, um, voices fighting to be heard and appreciated. So with that in mind, I'm going to ask a very light and simple question, beginning with Naomi. Is this a political conversation? Is this an imperialist conversation? And if so, how? I absolutely think this is a political conversation because for, for me, uh, a significant way to try and evaluate where we've gotten to, let's say after this conversation, or as we sort of continue to try to deepen our practices, are we able to express political values and what are those values? Uh, I think every time we're making a game, there are politics expressed at multiple levels of the game through the whole experience, whether you dissect that into content or mechanics or not. Um, and I think that this, this debate is important to that because we're sort of choosing what kind of tools we're using to try and get our politics across. Um, so, and my, my feeling is that we want to have as much power available to us in that process as possible. Um, at least for myself, I don't know, maybe some of you have terrible politics that I would disagree with, so maybe I, you know, I wouldn't want you to have those tools. No, but really, I, I kind of think in order to be able to use games to do what we, the best possible things we can think of to do with them, we don't want to limit or restrict our approach or to say, you know, we should just toss this, uh, this baby out with the bathwater all the way out the window because it's kind of a, a hoary, stodgy way of looking at things. Um, I may be not as worried as Nick is about falling into a dark ages, because I, I think that there is a lot of institutional power already behind some of these approaches. But I'm, I'm actually more concerned about individuals who might say, you know, I, I am, I, I'm not really down with looking at things as systems or at, 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 with Nick's logical or mathematical approach, so I'm going to sort of do it this other way. Uh, at, simply because it seems cooler and popular. I think that that, that actually may be a real risk uh, of faddishness. And um, I think it actually privileges people who have the ability to be able to, to intuitively produce something um, rather than taking a methodical craft approach. And I don't want to privilege only the folks who, who have some sort of ability wherever it comes from, um, whether it comes from their own background or maybe they were raised by an artsy family or something. I actually want to want everybody to be able to make games. And that, to me, is the reason why it's important to preserve multiple methods of coming at this question. And, and that's incredibly political as well and falls along race lines, class lines, all sorts of things. Would someone like to ask a question of Naomi? Maddie would like to ask a question. <laughs> I saw her paddle first. <laughs> so um, the thing that I have an issue of just preserving all methods is that 
okay, so we understand that sometimes my scalpel saves you and sometimes it stabs you in the heart and kills you. And we're just gonna have to roll with that for a bit. But like, I kind of wonder who are the people who most often get stabbed in the heart? And then what are the kinds of games that also get cut out very often? And I feel that those sorts of things that are, you know, are, are collateral damage um, are, 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 are uh, related to one another. And I kind of object to this because it's kind of like saying, well, yes, we're flawed it, you know, human beings, and I understand that I'm totally punching down on this, but I don't know what else to do. And what I think my position is trying to say is, why can't we actually restructure something that we know, even if it doesn't engage in the same kind of depth that you perceive, is something that doesn't have to deal with collateral damage. Like there are ways to talk about uh, interaction and players and all these kind of things without having to have mechanics and contents be separated from each other in any meaningful way. Yes. <laughs> sure, I guess this is my rebuttal. Sure. Um, I think that's an incredibly destructive and dangerous approach that Maddie has just suggested here. <laughs> that she's saying, you know, there are these methods that have been used destructively. We, we need to take a completely different approach. So I agree, like I've been saying, that we do need multiple approaches. We need new approaches. But I think it's, it's really risky to say, let's get rid of this one because it's been wielded terribly by some assholes, right? So if you, you can say like, okay, we need to react against that and, and take that away. Down the road, you will then find that you've actually cut out a whole bunch of people from the creative process, from being able to make games. Because the idea of, of jet that you can produce a game, and I'm talking primarily about, say, like, uh, about craft as opposed to, say, uh, criticism, which I think is a different story. But if you say, you know, th the way that we should be making games is to think of it just as a totality. That privileges creators who are able to sort of intuitively produce a sort of a total experience without needing to engage in an analytical or method methodological process. Now, I don't think there's a huge risk of us falling into a dark ages like that, but if, I were to, if someone were to come to me and say, I want to learn how to make games, I would not, I would not want to say, well, the, the, the good thing to do right now is we're in an age where you, know, you just understand the whole game as, as one big thing, because that's really the truth, and that's how you should do it. Just, just make the game. That would be horribly irresponsible of me. I actually want to give that person multiple different approaches and say, you know, I don't think you should wield this scalpel. You know, when you're using the scalpel, don't stab people in the heart. There have been a rash of heart stabbings lately, especially targeting games made by women. This is really not cool. You need to use this responsibly. You need to understand what the effects are. But I'm, I'm going to give this to you because I think that this is how you're going to be able to, to get at being able to be yourself, express yourself, use that tool for really positive ends. Um, and I think that I, I believe in your ability to do that. I'm not just going to take it away because there's some assholes. So with the visceral, met vi visceral metaphors that we're using today, this is something that we all feel in a very bloody way. Um, so a lot of interesting points here, but I'm going to try to pose a, a, a sort of difficult question uh, for some of you. I guess uh, we can start with Nick, and I want to bring Mohini in on this one as well. Do you think that sure. there is value in discussing mechanics outside of their intended context. I think each of you in some way has conceded that you know, neither aesthetics nor mechanics are, it's not a binary condition where you, know, you have to choose one or the other. But what can we learn from abandoning ideas of context? Is that wise? I, I think that it is wise to dissect mechanics and abandon context in thinking about mechanics because the mechanic as a piece of logic is something that can be re purpose for lots of purposes. And to the point about you know, imperialist purposes, political purposes, purposes of the tools of power, um, once they're disentangled from their context, then those tools can be redeployed for voices that haven't had access to them before or to disempowered groups. Like techno the way technology can be. Like technology was a force of imperialism, but technology can also be appropriated by people who suffered under imperialist messages to rebuild themselves into something else that they want to be, whatever that is. And the power of that technology is something that, that, that can't be denied. It's not that, in the end of the day, physics remains an imperialist force. Like, physics becomes something that enables people to have power and have access to technology and have access to uh, communications that they wouldn't have had before. And that's not to replicate anybody else's methods, but to do whatever they want. And I feel like game mechanics, 
game mechanics have exactly the same purposes, and we see that all the time. We see that in the use of games that were used for American propaganda to be used for Iraqi propaganda. We see that in the use of war games being defanged into pacifist games. We see that in the use of games that were specifically designed to work on, on sort of like unconscious racial biases used to expose those racial biases. So I think that because we have those abilities, we want to use them, and why would we ever deprive people who wanted to make a message from the tools they could use to make that message? Mohini. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So I think, I think uh, what really hit me from what Nick said was that he basically described um, techno-evangelism, right? Um, where we assume that uh, the tools we have, that we have finessed in, say, a Western context, are going to be given to the East to sort of reuse to save themselves. I, in practice, or in my current uh, design practice, I've rarely seen that happen. When you reappropriate a system perfected in a different context, it rarely remaps into a new context exactly. That's because cultural context impacts the way logic is considered and used. So in the East, we have different forms of philosophy that I guess are as valid as Western schools of philosophy. However, they aren't similar in the structures by which they assume different aspects of logic, for lack of a better word. Uh, when we're talking about something like technology, technology right now is used as a neoliberal tool. It's used as a tool of oppression in a lot of situations. It creates a false need for people in spaces where the need may not really be. So I don't really buy this um, argument of separating the context of logic. I, mind you, I don't think logic is not important. I think logic is very important. It's essential. But I think it's essential to see logic through the lens of its culture because culture impacts the way logic is formed. Yes, absolutely. Uh, the context of culture affecting who receives information in what way. Uh, Maddie, you haven't weighed in on this yet. Would you like to? Right. Um, so kind of ripping off of what Mohini just said, um, I think it's a, 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 a very unhealthy and, um, you know, uh, precedent to say, well, here's this thing that is probably going to, like, fuck you up, but, hey, you're going to be able to use it a little to then, you know, maybe come at us. And the thing about it is that when we look at technology right now and we see what kind of people are getting money from technology, what kind of people are getting access from technology, and these all these assumptions that like the world has technology. It's like, no, the world does not have technology. You know, we're all here in this wonderful space and everything. There's so many people without technology and are, have seen a, not a single cent from technology. And I feel like this is what's coming up with this debate when it comes to like this sort of, um, you know, prizing of this, you know, mechanics and this idea that we can just, you know, take away mechanics from, from context because it just assumes that we can just ship it out and everyone will just use it their own way and everyone will be happy and, and fine, but things that we're not, like you're shipping out a context. You're giving out a loan that people don't know that they're paying interest, they need to pay interest on. And I just think that that's a really, like it might be like coming from a good place, but it's like a kind of like a, na uh, like a naivete that is hurting others. We're gonna stay with this one a bit because I want to hear from everyone, Nick. <laughs> uh, we don't make technology, we discover technology. Technology pre-exists our discovery of it. We make things that utilize the science that exists in the world. And so as far as that's true, all technology that's ever been built comes out of the context of the people who created it. But it doesn't mean that that discovery itself is political. That discovery is a discovery that can be used by anybody who has access to it. Now, we can argue about the ability of people to have access to it. We can argue about the accessibility of people to game mechanics that were built in effectively a Japanese and Western system and then sort of imported to the rest of the world, right? Um, but the fact remains that the mechanics are discovered, and we know what they are, and we can reuse them and repurpose them. And the idea that that logic at the heart of all of this kind of bears the weight of that context forever is maybe the most disempowering statement I've ever heard. And just to say it out loud, I am a techno-evangelist. I am absolutely a techno-evangelist. Were this a panel about techno-evangelism, I would list off statistics about literacy, death rate, birth rate, life expectancy, uh, like relative incomes around the world that, that would demonstrate quite effectively the fact that technology and science and the development of education has been good for just about everybody around the world in some way unequally and unfairly unequally and, ir and immorally unequally. But it has been better for everyone. Now, when we talk about games, uh, that, that's a different kind of topic because we're not, like the way that games get used imperialistically if we're comparing this to like you know, the, the imperialism of the 18th century, we're, we're on a very different terms. But I still hold to the, the argument that 
what we've discovered in these places, especially given the increased accessibility of technology and the fact that games are becoming cheaper and cheaper to make and that more and more voices are being heard in games, that in itself itself is an indication that those tools are available to people and that they can be used to do new things. And I personally am excited to see how people use those things. And I think there's enormous possibility for those things to be expressed in new ways and to create new kinds of work. Naomi, do you want to round out that question? Yeah, I think Yes, um, I do actually. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> So I think it makes us feel well, very let's good. Let's let Mohini continue. I, I, I don't want to deny that I was part of this conversation or I lean towards that logic when I was also living in New York. And I think moving out of the West, so to speak, has uh, really put things in context for me a little bit, um, especially about this idea of uh, game tools being available, empowering everyone to make games at the same sort of scale as we make games in the West. So. I speak to a lot of uh, local indies in India right now, and one of the things they keep talking about is being excluded from conversations and spaces where games are made and spoken about and discussed and upheld. And why is that happening? The tools that are available, they're making games that are comparable in quality. However, they're more likely to get called clone. They're more likely to get called uh, um, out for ripping off aesthetics that aren't really valid arguments often. And there are ways in which the tools of like the superior or the dominant cultural context doesn't accept things made using those tools that are made outside of that cultural context. Yeah, I think it that's actually... It might make us feel good to think that we have discovered technology, but that's not really true. We make technology. We discover the logic of technology. We make, what the, we make the objects that come out of it. And those objects definitely empower certain people more than others. I think it's really naive to think it doesn't. Because um, that's how accessibility functions. People can, everyone can know how to make Unity uh, games on Unity, but that doesn't mean everybody's Unity games will come at a similar platform or at the same comparable hierarchy level. And the reason for that isn't always qualitative, it's also where it comes from and other things like that. I mean, there's been controversies in the last year about uh, games being called clones really, really easily. And I think that just goes to speak about how accessibility to tools doesn't necessarily mean inclusion in the conversation. Absolutely. So that's my two cents. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. I think we've definitely seen some situations over the past year where what would have been called a clever twist on a classic mechanic if it was done by an American indie is called a ripoff and a clone because it's done by a Vietnamese indie. We've seen that happen. Naomi. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I... I I agree with so much of what has been said. Uh, I think it's a little risky to to talk about technology in the sense that it's frequently used lately, right? Be, as something that sort of flows out of Silicon Valley, maybe with a little some help, help from some people in China, and then sort of goes everywhere else. And, and there's no question that that is a, a dominant way that technology is being deployed now. But if we step back a little bit, I think we have to also have to remember that that science, that the ability to build machines, to build things, to make games, is actually the, the birthright of every human being on the planet, and that it's been stolen for millennia from civilizations around the world, from people of color, and aggregated in European powers, right? So gunpowder invented in China, stolen. Uh, algebra invented in the Middle East, and sort of now sudden, somehow math and technology and military industry and so forth is all something that comes from the West and goes other places. So the, the question for me is, yeah, there is a whole enormous amount of bullshit going on right now, and there are bullshit ways that are, that are trying to oppose that, right, by saying like, oh, well, we'll just make sure that everyone in the world has a little laptop that will be made in Silicon Valley. <laughs> but that doesn't mean that we sh still shouldn't be talking about how everyone should be seizing these tools, seizing the means of production, if you want to get a little Marxist, right? <laughs> and and that, we, that we should all be using them. Now, I, to go back to the original question, I, I don't think that, that mechanics can ever be fully separated from their context. That's why I kept using the word bloody and talking about chunks of flesh. Those things always come along when you, when you take things back, right? They, when you, um, when uh, Liz Ryerson earlier today was talking about how hip hop culture was so enormously enriched by the fact that a whole bunch of turntables were stolen during the 1970 blackout here in the city, you know, those things, they, they came from another context. They were hot goods for the rest of their existence, right? And the same is true if you, if you steal, if you appropriate a mechanic from somewhere else. So, and, and this shows us how the act of creation is also always an act of criticism that exists in tension 
with other works. So when the Bill Viola and Tracy Fullerton made a game I mentioned earlier called Night Journey, they, they took the first person shooter mechanic and twisted it so that you were no longer shooting bullets, you were shooting memories about a space, right? And so it, it become, became a completely different and non-violent game that was about reflecting on the inside of your mind rather than sort of forcing your will on others. And, but that work exists in tension with every first person shooter that went before and everyone who played it who had been played a first person shooter before brought that and it was a commentary in all those games that came before. And that kind of work should continue. We should be critiquing, attacking games that we don't like. You can see my game that does this upstairs if you want. And, um, <laughs> and we should be using whatever weapons we have available to us and we shouldn't discard any weapon in this struggle too lightly. Yeah. <laughs> So speaking of our weapons, I'm going to ask each of you in turn uh, to talk a little bit about how you manifest your ideas in the work you do and how you'd like to see other people manifest uh, ideas in the work that they're doing. Maddie. So um, I've lately uh, stepped away from video games because I'm very, um, uh, I find that the, the deal that we make with tech and tools is unequal and always will be in our disadvantage. And so lately I've been making games that have been uh, basically uh, things that you do in real life, like uh, things that don't uh, create a designation of free time and work and where you just do it as is a part of your life. And I find that um, uh, that games on their own, kind of actually as Naomi might be familiar with this because I stole it from her, uh, this idea of separation of the work time and play time and how games have been used to go through the struggle of people's free time. And I find that if you can uh, create games and play experiences that involve the entire context of a person's life and involve it and make it irrevocably joined to them, that we're gonna get somewhere, we can look at those ty types of things, that where we can see how larger context, such as life itself, is uh, a play experience. And that I find that I I'm, I'm bewildered that if uh, you know game designers are already so aware of systems and mechanics and context, that they aren't like the, 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 the largest, most vocal social scientists uh, solving a lot of our social inequity in our lives. And that it seems that we can't find those types of people in uh, you know, these areas where mechanics are privileged. Rohini. Yeah, thank you, Matty. That was really interesting. Um, I think I would add to that and say that um, context is really important to me, um, especially in my practice. Um, so um, I am one half of a game design company called Antidote, and uh, we make games that are usually um, um, focused in real world context. So the tools of our game design are usually contextual. Therefore, I wouldn't say we make video games or analog games. We make games for the context into which they're required for. And in the last few years, um, not so my game design education is very Western. I learned all I know um, about game design, uh, mostly from Nick and Colleen at Parsons, um, which is a very sort of Western formalist approach. And I realized that while making games in the field. Oh, oh I have to press the slime button. Guilty. She's, you said the bad word. Oh, <laughs> the F word. <laughs> oh, I slipped there. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> we were doing so well. <laughs> <laughs> so do, I'm do sorry, I, please I, continue. Do I, do I lose my chance now? No, please continue. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what I mostly wanted to say, though, is that I find that my approach to making games is often not sufficient in encompassing stories that need to be told in the field. And um, in the last few years, I've been developing frameworks of co-design or working with people who are supposed to receive my game design objects. Um, in making the game with them. And this doesn't mean that I just come and make the system and they just get to pick the colors of the pieces and stuff like that. They make the system with me. And it's, of course, um, it's, it's slipshod and uh, messy and not very deep at the moment. But I think it's really interesting in terms of how do we engage with a topic versus somebody else who comes at it from their own personal context. So it, my experiences in making games just keep bringing me back to this idea that it's very dangerous to separate things like logic structures and context just because it's inconvenient in the discussion and it makes the discussion messy. I think I would, uh, I agree a, a lot with what Naomi was saying about it being a surgical process where 
the the blood and guts spill out when you try to separate them. And I I I, I think I uh, echo that a little bit. Thank you. So Mohini, you build systems in tandem with the people for whom they're intended. I think that's that's really interesting. Uh, Naomi, you started to touch on this a bit in your work, but how do you sort of express your values through the work that they do, or, or through the work that you do, or manifest your ideas through what you create? And how would you like to see others do the same? So with the stuff that we're talking about today, um, I think I'm I'm very much about the the bloody gutsy process. <laughs> um, yeah, and I think that, that comes up for a lot of people who try to create things. It's a, you're, you're sort of like vomiting up your insides to some extent. And, um, and I, I just want to make it clear that I, I don't think that what we're talking about is systems or game mechanics. It sounds very cold, but, uh, but I don't think that they are, in fact, structures of logic or math. I think that there's something more mysterious going on, some things that we don't understand about our own mind. Maybe we will one day, but we certainly, probably not anytime soon, we're trying to sort of pull these things out of our minds, of, of how we see other people's minds reflected. Um, and, and that this is inherently a, a gory process. And so, but I, I always try and, and relish that, that ripping apart, that surgical process. It's not something that I would do if I'm trying to appreciate the totality of a game. But when I'm trying to make something new, I, I am ruthlessly willing to steal things from anywhere and like rip rip the seams out, out of other games, which fortunately doesn't affect other people's ability to play them, um, and, and, and just sort of do whatever it takes. So the, the example that comes to mind for me since we're talking about the separation of, of content and mechanics or mechanics from their context um, is my project uh, Lace Runner, which was very much inspired by the way that Maddie Bryce plays uh, the game Netrunner, a game that she's very good at, that, that is an uh, extremely complex system with a lot of rules, but that has an emotional tenor to it that's very much about, about intimacy, about secrecy, about revealing parts of yourselves uh, in a way that, that feels very much like a human relationship. And this, this is actually something that I observed from the way that Maddie talks about the game, right? And so my, my thought about doing this, I also realized like the, there's something about the, the theme of Netrunner, this is cyberpunk hacking, that makes it a little less accessible than I would like if I want to be able to share it with, with friends, with loved ones who are not as immersed in nerd culture, who are a little bit suspicious of anything kind of beyond the Game of Thrones point, right? Um, and so what, what I did was I, I ripped Netrunner apart from its theme, which in the case of Netrunner is relatively, uh, is relatively easy. They're sort of, they're joined in a lot of places, but it is like ripping a seam. And I, I, I put a different theme on it, where instead of um, being about hacking and sort of this impersonal process of jacking into a, a deck and uh, using some jargony software to sort of decompile some security software somewhere else. I, I made it into a social game. Decompiling in Netrunner. <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, yeah, and the Lee is also an inspiration for this. Yeah, I'm sorry, de I believe is the accurate term. Thank you. This is, this, thank, you thank you, Lee, for, for illustrating how incredibly <laughs> stupid all of this vocabulary <laughs> attached to, to Netrunner is. Uh, even though it's a wonderful game, right? So I, I, I chose I'm to I'm going to have to cut you off there. <laughs> no, I, I actually, I do want to make sure that we get everyone to have a chance yeah. to have a closing slip thought. But aesthetic and logical vivisection, repurposing, bloody, bloody guts stuff. And check out, uh, Naomi has some of her Lace Runner stuff online. It's really, really cool. Um, Nick, would you like to talk about how you express your, your values through your work? I don't disagree with any of my worthy opponents. Um, I just see myself as a craftsman. Um, and by that I mean that I, I think very specifically and very concretely about the things I do when I make things. If I'm making a game for someone, I talk to the audience because the audience knows what the audience likes and I have to make things that the audience likes. If, and if likes means make sad things, make scary things, make challenging things, then I make sad or scary or challenging things. I speak to the people I work for. Uh, if they have a message, an educational message, a political message, uh, a healthcare message, a journalistic method message. I make sure that I rely on the expertise of people who are not in my field and who understand things that I don't understand and I don't presume to understand them. And what I do is I sit down with my box of tools and I make the things. And I make them by relying on the, you know, as Naomi suggested, although I would use less bloody imagery, <laughs> the, um, the, the things that I've extracted from other games, the things I've learned from playing other games, the things I've experimented with. Um, I don't have all the answers about mechanics, and so I prototype, which is what we're all taught as game designers, is to, is to try things and see how they work. And I build them up with an understanding that there's an aesthetic at the end I'm trying to reach, and that a system, 
designed correctly will get me to that aesthetic. And everything that I make is part of that process. So the context of it in terms of where it's served and how it's served and the representations of it in terms of how it's depicted in visually and audially and narratively, all of those are components of it too. But one component that's at the center of this, because it is the center of this, it's what the player does, is the mechanical process. And that I cobble together from you know, levels and hammers and nails and screwdrivers and pliers. Um, and I, and, I, and I, I would love to be more poetic about it, right? I would love to stand up here and talk about like, like, like the, the high aspirations that I have when I do this, and I certainly dream about my work, and when I make artwork, which is just for me, I certainly have like really high aspirations for it. I wanna do crazy, beautiful things. But at the end of the day, I mix paint. At the end of the day, I sketch on a canvas. At the end of the day, I do studies. Like, and, I, and I do studies in pencil just to see how a line works, to make sure the line works right. And I think if I don't do that, I'm not doing my work. So each panelist is going to get a pretty hard 60 seconds to deliver a closing thought. Before we do that, though, I'd like to invite you all to shake hands, if you would be willing, and, or pat, pat someone's monitor with respectful touch. <laughs> <laughs> The panelists have done an amazing job tackling a very complicated subject um, with aplomb and intelligence. Uh, so, so going back to our running order, Maddie, do you have a minute to close us down with a closing thought? So um, I do um, agree that there are, we, we shouldn't be uh, existing in completely extremes. And the thing that I would like to propose is that the thing that I'm proposing is not extreme, and that it is not within a binary and it's not within a spectrum and that what I have might be outside and to give it more of a chance to see it as less of just being something that's against you because maybe it's not all about you and maybe this is something else from somewhere else that's a little bit more mystical and could require a little bit more care and time and understanding. Mohini. Great. First job. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think uh, I think we can all agree that um, we're not that that far apart in terms of how we're approaching the topic. Um, and I think uh, what I would like to see in this conversation is a separation between the act of making a game and the act of critiquing a game, because I think the pers perspectives with which we approach both of those activities are different, and games occupy a separate role in each of them. Um, I think personally, uh, context is really important to me, so I really can't foresee a future where we talk about logic as separate from the context of its application. I think a large part of it is just the cultural context from which I come from and how different structures of logic have been reappropriated to be used to better, um, in kind of a patronizing way, our lifestyle in the so-called third world. And I find that entire engagement a little bit problematic. So in my personal practice, I would hope to not do that in the use of games, which I think is emerging media have a chance to really occupy a role as something that could break the problematic relationships media has had with cultural hegemony. So I would like to think of uh, finding more holistic ways to take this conversation forward with all of my esteemed um, debaters. And I, I look forward to where this goes in the future. Thank you. Naomi. So again, I th think this is a really incredibly important conversation, and I, I love what everyone here has had to say. I think it's, uh, I just want to say, by any means necessary is what we should be doing. Um, because this work is important to, to do what Mo Mohini talks about and disrupt unjust ways that, uh, that media has been forced to relate to, to, to people around the world, to, to explore other ways of making things that break with tradition, um, but to, to, to do whatever it takes for you to be able to, to make a difference with what you're creating, to be able to put better values out in the world, to be able to express politics in a meaningful way that makes the world better, to be able to just deepen and make better, more wonderful, more beautiful games. We have to do whatever it takes. And so don't ever let anyone tell you that you're doing it the wrong way because you don't use math or logic, or because you do. Um, or because you need a craft approach that's very methodological and involves sort of taking things apart in minute detail, um, or because you are someone who is capable of sort of looking deeply inside yourself and vomiting out something wonderful and beautiful. <laughs> I'm sorry I'm so bodily, but uh, that's just the way I am. Um, all of these things need to be okay, 
We can't afford to sideline any of them because the, the, what's at stake is too crucial. And Nick. Uh, most of the way I think of myself for my entire life has been as a teacher. And as someone who teaches systems and tries to empower voices to make things, which is probably the best good I give into the world whenever I do, the way I understand that is by helping them make good things. And there isn't one way to make good things. And certainly I don't know all the ways to make good things. But we've learned things as, as an industry. We've learned things as a discipline. And I think that what I want more than anything is to pass those things on. I don't want them to be denigrated or ignored. I don't want them to be dismissed. And I don't want them to be reduced. I want them to be preserved as tools. And I want to pass those brushes on to people to paint their own thing. Things that hate me, things that destroy my culture, things that reinforce whatever revolution they feel. Because what they make is not what's important to me. What's important to me is that they have the voice to make what they want to make, and they can make it as strongly and as effectively and as influentially as possible. Thank you very much. A big hand for the panelists tackling this very challenging topic. And thank you so much for your time and attention. I'm Lee Alexander. It's been a huge privilege to host this, and I hope you all have fun. Thank you. Thank you.